you or me. The video's about you, so you're doing it. All right, here we go. Angie story. Take one. Take one. Action. Hey, hey everybody. everybody. Well, let's start off with Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to everybody, because you're going to be watching this on Christmas Eve, and Christmas Eve is very relevant to this story. Yeah, it definitely is. Um, how do you want to start this out? You want to tell them what this video is about? Okay. This isn't our normal power tour. No, no, this is That's not our normal. That's going to be coming up. Don't worry. Yeah, this is not the normal power tour video. Um, this video is about my lovely esposa, <laughs> Mia Moore. Um, it's, it's all about her. Oh. So this is how the story of how A and D came to be. Became A and D, yes. Yes, how, how we became us. Yeah. So it does have car stuff in it, it does. but it's not all about cars. So we've, uh, we've kind of been approached before. Everybody knows that, well, not everyone, we won't say that. Some no. people know that we had some things happen to us. Yeah. So, so we're going to tell you about it today. So I hope you hang with us. Yes. So now will be a real good time to go bathroom break. <laughs> you know, come out and get you a put popcorn because you know, if you haven't heard the Angie story, you, you're going to want to sit down and pay attention. Y'all know we're all about the snacks and bathroom breaks. If you watched our power tour, yes. we're all about it. So I'll let you start it. Me start? Okay. Yeah, I'll let you start So it. how we got together, we were set up on a blind date. We were. She knew about it. <laughs> I had no idea. I was clueless, much like I am now. But it's, we got set up, and we went to a local little restaurant called Coochie's Little Italian Place. Delicious, by the way. And <laughs> they have corner booths that are round tables. And conveniently, someone was slid over next to me, <laughs> you know, when all like eight of us all went in and sat down to have lunch. Well, somewhere in the conversation, Angie asked to see the race car. Now, how we got set up on this blind date is she had told one of her girlfriends that she wanted to date a race car driver. Insert. <laughs> um, Which was very ironic, because she said, I've got just the person for you, and y'all are perfect. That was yeah. all she said. Yeah. So we get into the date. We're about time food's coming. She asked to see the race car. <laughs> and I kind of thought, you know, does she really? want to see the race cars you just be in conversation well we left really <laughs> we left coochies and really went to the shop and looked at the race cars and at that moment i knew it was check please she's the <laughs> one we're done here you know we can we can stop looking she she is the one if she really had interest in seeing the race cars she was the one so Needless to say, the very next racing season, when I filled out all my pit passes and all the crew and everybody to get in, Angie was filled out as the car owner. Yeah. We were just dating, <laughs> and she was filled out named as the car owner. I was the driver, and I was the crew chief for three other teams, but that's irrelevant. But she was car owner. Yeah. So... It was a lot of fun. When we did racing, it was a lot of fun. Yes. And Angie was there for my first win. Yes. So I, she was my good luck charm. Yes. My first, yeah. Um, so all of that led into us getting married. Yes. Which we got married <laughs> the first available Saturday <laughs> after, after racing, racing season. season. When, <laughs> when I proposed, Angie look, asked, next question, you know, when do you want to get married? My next answer was, when's racing yeah. season over? Yeah. So, so our wedding, coincidentally, first available Saturday after racing stopped. Right. First of October, yeah. we got married. So, yeah, that was our, uh, and our and our honeymoon gift was. Yeah, I couldn't help myself. We went to, we went to Florida. We went to Daytona, and that was back before Dale Earnhardt passed away. We're telling how old we are now. Yeah. 
I got to take his Dale Earnhardt's car, one of his old cars, around Daytona Speedway for the Richard Petty driving experience. I couldn't help myself. I had to get him something good. I, yeah. <laughs> so that's... That was for me to get to get in Dale Earnhardt's oh. car and go, because I had no idea it was Dale's car. It was just random. But yeah, that... It was awesome. He was a happy camper. You could have smacked me with a two-by-four and I wouldn't have stopped <laughs> smiling. Um, so, like all uh, newly married couples, we went on our honeymoon, came back, and went straight into normal life. <laughs> so, we were doing all the fun, new, normal, married things yeah. from October to December. Yeah, we made it three months as normal. Well, as normal as we're ever going to be. <laughs> um, but our very first married Christmas is where the story begins, really. Yeah. December 24th, which is Christmas Eve, which is, y'all are watching this, Christmas Eve. Yes, that's why this Christmas Eve is important to us. Yeah. So we are at the mother-in-law's house, Angie's mom, where she grew up. We were. And we're getting ready to have family dinner. Family breakfast. Yeah. Family breakfast. Family breakfast. Yeah, they, we changed it up that year, and we did family breakfast. And, and on, on the way up, I was not feeling well. Yeah. Angie had not been feeling well for... A while. Yeah, a while. Probably, we thought it was... Probably a month or so. We thought it was just the stress of her being married to me. <laughs> no, you know. no. We, um, we really didn't know what it was. I actually thought that I might have the flu, but the flu doesn't last a month. So. Yeah, yeah. So... so we uh, were there, and about lunchtime, yeah. Angie takes a coughing fit, and all of a sudden, she starts coughing up blood, which we knew was kind of kind of all of us was like, "This is not the flu." No, it was not. I had been feeling very nauseated that morning. I didn't eat much. Yeah. And uh, and then I had the coughing spell, and that's when we knew. So everyone. And the family was there, and it was a conclusion that I go to. Went to the local emergency room, which is a small, small little small town rural hospital, hospital, rural hospital. Right. We go to the emergency room, and of course, you know they're asking you all the standard yeah. form questions. You know, do you feel safe in your home? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Are you um, are you having are you having anxiety? Are you upset about the holiday? Yeah. And there was a nurse that wanted to give Angie uh, like a tranquilizer shot. Like a sedative. Like a sedative to calm her down because she'd made it to the point she was coughing up blood. So yeah, Angie's anxiety was Yeah, I was definitely on a level up here. So but I was like I told the nurse, I was like, No, I don't think this is a panic attack. I think we ought to hold off on that shot. Thankfully that was That was great a good move, thank you, honey. <laughs> yeah, that was a great decision. Yes. Yes. Um, so basically, they keep her under observation for a while and don't find out anything. Nothing comes back like abnormal. Yeah, nothing's, you know, nothing's like, oh, hey, that's what it is. No, no it wasn't that. So my sister is a nurse practitioner and she had come to the hospital. You know, we had phoned and said, hey, we're on the way to the hospital. My sister met us there. And she's like, maybe we need to go to the bigger hospital. It's an hour an away. An hour away. You right. know, maybe let them run some tests, see what's going on. And we're like, okay. And they were at the hospital. They were like, all right. That sounds, sounds like a good, good idea. You yeah. know, because she was, my sister's a, like I say, nurse practitioner, medically trained. And we're like, all right, we're releasing you to her. And, off you go. Y'all y'all go on over to the hour away hospital. Yeah, because on Christmas Eve, think about it, the ambulances were not running. Right. They have the paid ambulance service that would take you to the other hospital. But Christmas Eve, they were on the night off. Right. And you have to remember that this story right now we're telling you is like 20 plus years. 25 years. 25 years this year. Well, 20. 24. 24. Yeah, because we'll be married. Yeah, yeah, 25. yeah. 24. 24 years. Okay, so we leave the hospital, and my sh 
sister had a Chevrolet <laughs> Astro van. Remember the all-wheel drive? That thing was purple. You remember, or maroon? Yeah. Wasn't it maroon? Like I think a, it was supposed to be maroon, but it was more purple. Yeah, it, 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 it was uh, one of them awful earth tone colors, whatever. <laughs> um, but anyway. And I was still not really feeling well. Yeah, Angie was getting less and less with it yeah. as time went on. Yeah. She was, uh, she, she wasn't, she wasn't doing, you know, her condition was. It was deteriorating. It was going down. Yeah. So we leave the hospital, and I can remember, no, nobody watching this video, but the locals will know where the Dairy Queen is. <laughs> but the Dairy Queen is only maybe five miles at the yeah. most yeah. from the hospital. Uh -huh. So we had just left on an hour-long journey. And I vividly remember going by the Dairy Queen, you know, seeing the light, the lights that were still open on Christmas Eve and Angie stopped breathing and I don't mean like <gasps> held her breath I mean like literally she took that last breath sound lights out yeah and but she was still her eyes were still open but she breathed out and she didn't breathe back in and I was kind of sitting there and I was waiting because I was holding her in my arms. Back as, then, I guess seatbelts weren't as, we didn't worry well, about I mean, it. We didn't worry about it at, at that point, but yes. At that moment, <laughs> seatbelt wasn't a but real thing. when we tell you what happened next, we probably should Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, seatbelt probably should have. So I'm sitting in the second seat in the little Chevy Astro minivan thing and my sister is driving. And I don't remember. There wasn't anybody with us, was there? Mom was up front, wasn't she? Maybe you're right. I think she was in the seat up here. And I made the comment to my sister, I'm like, she's not breathing. And she's like, is she breathing shallow? And I'm like, no, she is not breathing. I mean, and time is elapsing this whole time because it took me a few seconds to realize that she wasn't breathing. And you know, the longer time went on, the more my anxiety. You know, normally I'm. He's a pretty chill guy if y'all don't know us. <laughs> I mean, he is, he's, he's not. And I'm kind of like, you know, this... she ought to be taking a breath here at some point, because I can hold my breath for a while. Yeah. You yeah. know. But not that long. Yeah, not as long as this has been going on. So I asked my sister, Again, more adamantly, I'm like, she's not breathing. What do I do? And she said, is her eyes open? I was like, yeah. I said, it was kind of eerie. I'm her sure. eyes were open. And just so y'all know, I do not remember any of yeah. this. <laughs> like, I, I do not. I only know what, what I was told. And so anyway, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt your flow. Yeah. But it was you know, kind of eerie because she was conscious. Her eyes were moving. Yeah, I'm sure that was weird. But no breathing. It wasn't breathing. So my sister says, basically, I had to make her angry. She's like, just make her scream. And I was in my head, I was like, what do you mean? What, what am I saying? And Robin goes, shake her. And I probably shook her harder than I should have, but there was a lot of adrenaline going on at that moment. And I don't remember and, it, I mean, so, you know. And I remember, and I shook her, and like I say, I probably, at that moment, I shook harder than I should have, but it did make Angie angry. And adrenaline kicked in, and she took a huge breath in and started breathing again. Now, her breathing was really shallow, but the breathing reflex took on over and she started breathing again. But until I got her angry, she went 30, 40 seconds easily. I mean, easily that long and not attempting to take a breath. So needless to say, my sister- In the midst of all of this. In the midst of all this, like I say, I drove race car, it's a race car kind of family. It's a race car kind of family. 
<laughs> My sister channeled her inner Dale Earnhardt, <laughs> and I swear at one point that Chevrolet Astro was up on two wheels <laughs> turning street corners. And normally, you have to think about the little small town we live right. in. You, you're not going to you, just... You can't pass a car uh -uh. on the side streets. Only on the main street do you have room to pass a car. On the side streets, somebody has to pull over into a parking spot and let, let you, you go, go by. Right, right, right. And my sister went down one of those side streets at probably 60 miles an hour, turned a street corner without letting <laughs> up. <laughs> and put that little van, I know it had to be up on two wheels at some point. I'm sure. And we rushed back to the hospital. Well, they immediately put her on oxygen. Yeah. They intubate her. Yeah. What was that, a few hours later? No, uh, maybe an hour later after he got there. Yeah. And put her up on the top <laughs> floor, which is only six. The hospital's only It's six. very small. It's very small. It's so so we, got, we, we got in the ICU with that. Me pulling that trick. We were yeah, there. yeah. So they intubate her to get her to breathe. And we're all like freaking out because this went to a whole new level when she stopped breathing. It went from she had the flu, wasn't feeling good, to not breathing. Right. So that just, you know, amped it up a whole other notch. Right. So now this is Christmas Eve night. Right. This is the middle of the night. You know, oh, well, probably by that point it was what one, two in the morning. Yeah, yeah. When when they finally let us come in the room with you after they had you settled as you were going to be, I was probably sitting by her bedside at one or two in the morning. Yeah. So. And. Then I kind of pretty much deteriorated over Christmas Day, during the day. Yeah. I kept little. Um, I started going into renal failure. And well, you already were in. I renal. was already in it, but I mean, they found. They it. found it. They found it at that point, and um, of course, I was having issues with my heart, and yeah, it was it was a whole lot of hot mess, like the car we're working <laughs> on. <laughs> so, <clears throat> anyway. But yeah, on Christmas Eve night, me and the Lord had a lot of conversations. Because when I was a teenager, when I was a little kid, I went to church a lot. But when I was a teenager, needless to say, I was bad. Yeah, well, so I strayed away a lot. Well, that night, Christmas Eve night, sitting about from 1 or 2 in the morning till maybe 7 when the sun came up, sitting beside that bed, me and the Lord had a lot of conversations that morning. And... Oddly enough, someone gave me a ride to go get my truck. I think it was my sister. Might have been, might have been your sister. Yeah. Because it was really weird. Time stopped for both our families. Mm -hmm. Because on Christmas morning, nobody did anything. The kids didn't open presents. No. You know, nobody had a family gathering. It was time had stopped. Right. That Christmas of 99... Wasn't it 99? Yeah, it yeah, was 99. 99. The Christmas of 99 just really didn't exist for either of our family. Right, everything stopped. Um, I remember going to your, yeah, because I went to your sister's house to get something to eat. Probably. Yeah, and because I remember the girls were wondering why they couldn't open their presents. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think Santa came to the see the younger kids, of course, but, like, no presents were distributed or open so yeah yeah but we went to get my truck and of all mornings don't ask me <laughs> why the lord picked that morning but my battery was dead in my truck and i know i was <laughs> like time, yeah. yeah i was like i was like i just had a five hour conversation with lord i was like lord i know you don't give us any more than we can handle and i was like I just didn't know I could handle so much. <laughs> so I called my brother. He came and got me, got me a jump start so I could drive back to the hospital. And then, like Angie said, that whole day, Christmas day, yeah. her condition continued, continued to go downhill. Right. 
she was somewhat conscious. They had her intubated, but she was still conscious. She could draw on paper and communicate with us. She couldn't talk. You know, of course, the tube was down her throat. But she could draw on paper and communicate with us. Well, that deteriorated over as the hours went. And it got to, I want to say, shift change on Christmas night, which was it would be either 6 or 7 o'clock on Christmas evening. I don't know what time the hospital, but I remember all the nurses yeah. going you, in. Are you telling about the doctor coming in, the old yeah. school doctor? Yeah, the, the old, old school doctor from the local hospital. He's probably been in, He had probably been in practice at that point. Oh, I don't know. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, who knows how many years he'd been practicing. Yes. And he, he looked at me and he said, I have done everything I can do. He said, all the tools and all the equipment I have here, he said, I've done everything I can do. He said, if you want her to live, you're going to have to get her to UVA. Which, I don't know if you've never heard of UVA, University of Virginia, Virginia um, it's a medical center. It's a teaching college. Right. Um, an awesome teaching college. Yeah, they did a good job. <laughs> um, but he told he told me, you know, I had to make that decision that I had to get her there. But he was like, I've done everything I can do, and and to me, I appreciated that honesty. Absolutely. That he would tell me, you know, because he was like, he said, if you don't get her out of here, he said, I've done everything I can do. He said, she's going to die if I don't get her out of here. And I'm like, okay. I was like, all right. What what do we need to do? I mean, like you know, let's. I mean, y'all. Because because I'd already went. I told him the story about us trying to drive to run over, and we went past Dairy Queen to stop breathing. I was like, well, let, I don't think I'm qualified anymore to be transporting her. Well, let's put it in perspective for him. We've been married three months. We are how old? You were twenty five. I was twenty five. He was twenty one. I was twenty one at that point. So we were very young. We didn't have any idea how to navigate what we were facing at that age. We was good. We was paying rent. Yeah. Much less. I'll, I'll put it to y'all this way. We had a couple hundred bucks in our checking account. We had two. We had two hundred and thirty-five dollars in our checking account. And we thought we're the rent, out. Was, rent was paid for the month. Yeah. Bills were paid for the month. We had got Christmas presents for everybody. We thought we were and winning. And we, we had two, and I remember, we had $235 we left were. to our name. So if that puts it in perspective. So this elderly doctor really helped facilitate what was about to happen. Yeah. And he said, I had to make the call. And which, at the time, I didn't fully understand what that meant. And I would have still made that decision even if I had understood it. But I didn't understand that the way insurance worked, oh, yeah. maybe back then or still now, I don't, I'm not sure. We don't want to find out again. Yeah, we don't. <laughs> but if you make the call for a life flight, that if you ask for it, insurance doesn't have to pay. Right. And that was, like I say, it, you know, I would have still made that choice, but I didn't fully understand what that meant at that moment. Not that it was important, but I didn't, right. I didn't get that concept of why he was asking me. Right. Um, so he made, he made, he made, he made the call, you know, well, the first helicopter they said was broke down. Now, years later of reflection, and my brain tells me that I've been on a lot of crews that had to work on Christmas Eve. And not saying somebody would say a helicopter was broke when it wasn't, but I'm thinking there was a crew somewhere that didn't want to have to fly on Christmas night. Right. I mean, I'm just guessing. I won't, I can't directly say that, but and then, I know some crews that would have done it. <laughs> yeah. And then the second one, the second helicopter they did call that was operational, flew to the wrong hospital. No joke, I can't make this stuff up. They went to the wrong hospital. Only us. Yeah. So by the time the helicopter does get to Angie, 
Now they take her and put her in one of the little spacesuit blankets. I didn't know. I wish the, I could remember that because all of my family vivid. And I, I didn't know it at the time, but it's like an aluminum foil thing, keep, and it was to keep heat in. Yeah. Because it was because the helicopter was cold. You know, it was December twenty I mean, fifth. Yeah. You know, it's frigid outside. Yeah. It was a, like a spacesuit blanket to keep her warm, but it. It looked like she was the Tin Man from Wizard of Oz, <laughs> aluminum foil, you know. <laughs> I wish I could remember that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the crazy part was she came, remember we were on the sixth floor. She became conscious enough that she heard the rotor blades of the helicopter and wrote on the paper, is that for me? So she was with it, yeah. some and not and yeah. some, but she knew the sound of that helicopter was for her. And needless to say, she flies and gets to UVA, which is in Charlottesville. What was it, like an hour flight? No, for on the flight, you're like 20, 25 I, minutes. I didn't realize how long it was. Now, us, <laughs> normally, when you drive it, it is an hour 30, hour 45 minutes driving. <laughs> okay. Insert medical emergency. Insert medical <laughs> emergency, family full of race car drivers. Um, I wasn't driving. I was, I was riding. Um, but her mom had a red Cadillac. <laughs> and her brother, I believe your brother was driving. I think he was. I think... He went off, now there is a hairpin cloverleaf exit ramp in Charlottesville. <laughs> You've all seen the you know, big city cloverleaf exit ramps that you're only supposed to be doing 25 miles an hour on. <laughs> I think he tried one at about 95. And you know Cadillac's got nice soft <laughs> suspension. You know, you ride down the road floating on air. It really and, was a nice riding car <laughs> oh, yeah. until this event. <laughs> And basically, he comes off that ramp, and I'm pretty sure that the right rear tire was off the ground. That soft <laughs> suspension had rolled that Cadillac. You know, we were all in the car going. And your sister and mom were with y'all still yes. in the Astro van. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, the Astro van and the Cadillac were flying down. Yo, they were flying low <laughs> under radar. I'm telling you, on Christmas night, I am thankful there were no state troopers on the interstate because we'd had a lot of explaining to do. Oh, gosh. But now, mind you, they've had the time to work on Angie before we got there, okay? Because it takes, you know, she flies her, here, boom, she's there. They've got time to evaluate her, work on her, you know, what's her situation, his condition, and if you guys aren't familiar with EVA, the way it works when you roll in like that, they've got all all the departments work simultaneously together. So you got a heart problem, you get a cardiologist. You got a kidney problem, you get a nephrologist. You got, you know, you got something going on. They all work together. Yeah. So when we show up, I already have a team. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We we show up, and it's probably two a.m maybe a little later on Christmas night. Now, which would really be the day after Christmas. Technically, yes. <laughs> time, <laughs> time to run together for the rest of us. <laughs> um, but we get there and that place is a ghost town. Cause you know, anybody that's had the option of getting off for the holidays took that option. They're at home. So it is like skeleton crew. They have turned off the lights and the heat to the waiting rooms because there's nobody in them. So we crash the ICU waiting room like 10 people. Her family, my family, you know, we're getting all blended together real fast. You know, sometimes it takes years. Both families really meet each other at a wedding. And then you kind of see each other at holidays and family gatherings after that. Mm -hmm. Three months after we got married, our families got blended yeah. real well. Yes. But we're there. It in was the pretty awesome. I wish I could have saw it. <laughs> I wasn't meaning to do that, but I mean, you know what I mean. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so I roll into the waiting room and 
basically the doctor comes out and everybody's bombarding this guy with questions. Right. And I mean, my sister-in-law, she was a nurse. Mm -hmm. Of course, my sister was a nurse practitioner. You know, they're all asking medical questions. I'm asking questions. My you know, mom was asking you know, questions. Her mom, sure. your mom's asked questions. My mom was that. You know, everybody is basically bombarding this doctor when he walks in the room. And did he? Was he the one that looked like? Yes. Oh, okay. But and I and I know he had to do it, and I appreciate the fact that he did. But he basically. I won't say set us all straight, but he put every one of us in our place real fast. And he looked at me, you know, he said, he said, who's the husband? And I was like, me. And he's like, all right, I am only talking to you. He said, you're the, he said, the only one I want questions from is you. He said, now, before you ask me any more questions, he said, I have something to tell you. And I'm like, Oh, okay, all right, you know. I'm, He's thinking they done figured out what's yeah, wrong. Yeah, you know, I'm like, hey, what day is she getting ready to come home? <laughs> you know, do I need to bring the car around? You know, y'all you know, want to keep her 24 hours observation? You know, I'm yeah. like, no, I'm like, no, clue. no, no clue. He looks at me as straight and stone-faced as he could. You know, like I said, it's two in the morning. He says Angie has a 2% chance, a 2 a 2% chance of living six hours to see the sun come up at 8 o'clock in the morning. You know, that'd be December 26th. He's given her 2% chance to live six hours with all the medical equipment they got, the best team of doctors, all the medical equipment money can buy, and he's only given her a 2% chance to live six hours. So all of us got a reality check real quick. So basically all of us just shut up as in shock. And I was like, well, you need to stop talking to us and you need to go in there and do what you can. And he was like, okay. Well, little did I know back then they made you sign consent forms for everything. For every crazy procedure and needless to say they took biopsies of every part of angie to try to see what was going <coughs> on and she told me the heart biopsy she remembers she i was, do i do remember that she was conscious awake for a heart biopsy like run that one through your head for a minute fun times um but they came in and would get me to sign a consent form now, mind you, we're in a cold waiting room. Heat's been turned off. It's dark. Ain't got no lights. And the only light is, is every time they come out of the ICU, the doors would open up. A nurse would come out, get me to sign a form. I'd give, you know, give my consent. And the door would go back shut. And we would all kind of talk for a minute, whatever procedure they were doing. And then we'd go to sleep. We'd try to get a little bit of rest. Then, you know, 30 minutes later, door bust open again, wake us all back up. This went on till about five in the morning and the little nurse that came out, I told her, I said, ma'am, I said, I know you're doing your job. I said, but how about you just go ahead and bring me all in forms? <laughs> I said, I'm gonna sign them all. Just let me sign. I said, and y'all just stop wasting time and do what you need to do. And needless to say, I didn't see that little girl no more. She didn't. I don't know whether she went home for a shift, but nobody brought me any more papers. They just did what they needed to yeah. do. But, but the, guess what? Spoiler alert. You made it? I made it. <laughs> and guys, we know you're watching this and you're probably thinking, why are, why are they doing, doing this video? So I'm going to insert why. Okay. Um, you'll, you'll hear a little bit later on about how we get approached to do, um, a magazine article later on after I started to get better. But the main thing on this is just to put it out there. If it helps one person, no, you're probably might not be dealing with what I have dealt with all these years, but 
if it can help one person to realize that you can do it. It's not easy, you know. And we'll kind of explain more as we go. But if we help somebody, great. And plus, I know all of you know wanted to know what really happened. So we wanted to put this out there. Yeah. So I'll let you continue. Sorry, I didn't mean to. I just felt like they're probably all like, oh, my gosh, what are they doing? But <laughs> this is our story. Sure. So anyway, for the next how many days? For the next 12 days. I was on life support. Yeah, Angie was on life support, and they and, did plasmapheresis. And I was highly sedated through all this, so I didn't really, I wasn't really with it. I was, they pretty much had to sedate my body to make my body stop fighting. Yeah, because what happened was Angie's antibodies tried to kill her. Yeah, they tried to attack. They saw Angie as a foreign entity and turned on, kind of like when you get a cold, your antibodies turn on, fight the virus, whatever, try to kick it out, you know, get rid of it. Somehow. My body kept it turned on. Yeah, she, so her, my, her, her little antibodies got confused. And started attacking my good organs. Yeah, started attacking Angie. Yeah. So. Which basically meant that her aorta, you know, your aorta goes out of your heart, goes down through your body and branches off. Angie's was, it was attacking her aorta and it was stopping off. So just stopping. imagine that Angie had ate like 9 million cheeseburgers <laughs> and had the cholesterol, you know. Of a 90-year-old. And cholesterol of a 90-year-old and it was just choking off her aorta. Yeah. So, and, and I mean, no, it did not fully, ever fully close up, but it did. It did, yours goes like this, mine goes like this. So, and it got smaller at the bottom. Yes, but your renal arteries did close off. My renal did close off. Okay, yes. so the renal arteries, this is a little medical lesson. <laughs> renal arteries are the ones that go off and feed the kidneys. Right. And here's where we're gonna get in like car thing. The kidneys are like the oil filter. <laughs> it takes out all the bad stuff. Right. All right. If your body senses <laughs> the oil, since blood is not getting cleaned, it makes your heart pump faster to get more blood to the kidneys. So when Angie's kidneys got stopped off and couldn't get any blood flow, there was nothing cleaning the blood. Right. So of course her body's getting the message, hey, Something's going on. Oil's getting a little dirty down here. We need to pump a little faster. Yes. So that's where, the when, remember when we said in the beginning that she was coughing and spitting up blood. Her blood pressure actually got high enough from her body continuously trying, like, hey, we need to clean them kidneys. Kidneys need to get to work. We need to clean this blood. Her blood pressure every day was climbing higher and higher. The capillaries in her lungs actually started exploding and bleeding inside her lungs because the blood pressure was so high. So when they brought her in, your, let's see, your heart rate was 180 yeah. and she was asleep. Yeah. You know. I was running a marathon in my sleep. Yeah, oh yeah, she was running a marathon in her sleep. But what they did was they did the plasmapheresis and dialysis mm -hmm. to get everything cleaned up on her. And they did the plasmapheresis to get her antibodies out because they were all angry. Right. They were angry antibodies. Right. So then they gave me all new ones. Yeah, they gave you, you know, after 12 days of cycling out, I think they got them enough of them. And what they did was they figured out, what's the name of your disease, my dear? So, my disease is actually called Takiatsu Arteritis. And, and we, that's because a little Japanese guy discovered it, so he got to name it. He got to name it. Um, and to be perfectly honest with y'all, the right doctor was on call. When I came into UVA, he knew that I had some form of a autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. He didn't exactly know which one, 
So in this 12 days of them doing plasma and paresis, they would come in to David and my family and they would say, maybe she has this one or maybe she has this one or whatever. Well, back in the day, they didn't have cell phones. And well, we, they had cell phones, but not smartphones. Not smartphones, excuse me. So my brother and sister and my family would have to go over to the university and they would look them up every day. And they would come back and they'd tell David, oh, we, this one's not good, or this one would be okay, or this one has a good prognosis. Yeah. And then finally, they decided. Yeah, they finally decided. But see, they would go research every day in the library. <laughs> I would sit by Angie's bed. I mean, around the clock. I, now, they wouldn't let me stay at night in the ICU. No. We, me and the mother-in-law, <laughs> which... It, that, that was a whole different story. Spending spending the first few nights with your mother-in-law when you've only been married three months. That, remember the family's blending? You learn a whole lot, doesn't it? But we stayed at a Ronald McDonald house because, we, like I said, we didn't have any money. And and hotels are expensive. So. Yeah, so, so, you know, if y'all get a chance to s support the Ronald, the Ronald McDonald, McDonald house, do so. Because it really helps. Yes. Yeah. So, I would basically, I'd spend the night. When they would kick me out of the ICU, we would go spend the night in the Ronald McDonald house, and I would be back there first thing in the morning when they opened up. Well, I sat there all day, you know, basically watching the ventilator machine breathe for her, you know, day in and day out. And I don't know if you've ever seen anybody on a ventilator but they have the little suction tube. God, are you not telling That the nurses, the nurses come in because it's sad to say, but if you're on a ventilator long enough, you start gargling. <laughs> you and know. let's just go ahead and if y'all don't know us, I'll let you know, David is not a, a sit still kind of guy. Yeah, so he's a helper guy, which I appreciate. Yeah. So after like day eight, He's you know, because the, nurse, the nurses, you know, I've watched every move they've made. I've watched everything they've done because he's protecting me. Yeah, you know, I'm 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 watching everything that's going on, and the nurses have to come in like every thirty minutes, and all they would do is come in, disconnect her hose for a minute, stick the little wand in it, <laughs> suck all the stuff out, hook her back up. And go back out of the room. <laughs> well, I got, you know, every 30 minutes, I'd have to press the button and be like, oh, she's gurgling again, you know. Because I was, like, concerned. I was like, what, you know. And finally, one of the nurses is like, oh, it's just, you know, a thing that happens. It's nothing bad. Remember, we don't know what any of this is. This is all new to us. Yeah, it's all new. So I was like, oh, it's nothing bad? And she's like, no, it's just your body builds up fluid there and you're hearing it. So we just suck it out. And I was like, oh. <laughs> so I'll watch him do it a couple more times. And then I get tired of, you know, having to press the button and wait for them. They got busy one day. So I decided I would start doing it. Dr. Hurt in here. Yeah, so I disconnect Angie. <laughs> you know, put it back. <laughs> you know. And one of the nurses finally catches on. She's walking by, and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, what are you doing? I said, well, she was gurgling. You were busy. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, so when, you know. David they, they, became known, David is still known to this day as, and he really is, the best husband around. And when he's always good to me every day, but when I'm in the hospital, he is Johnny on the spot. He is there. They probably still talk about the time I fell, fell away. I mean, I, I woke up. All right. In the hotel, when she got moved out of ICU into a regular room, I could spend the night. Yeah, finally. So I just stayed in the room. I didn't have a bed. I slept on the floor. And one day when they moved her. I we got, got a window seat. Yeah, we got a room that had this like little shelf there at the window. <laughs> and it wasn't big enough for a bed. But I could let my feet hang over and I could sleep on it instead of being on the floor. So in the middle of the night, you know, I cleaned that. You know, I would get me a little blanket out of the closet. <laughs> you know, lean over, check on Angie. Yeah, 
She's still breathing. Okay, all right. I rolled over, kind of like <laughs> a lot of people do, and you know, while you're sleeping, you roll over. Well, when you're on a window seat that big, and you decide to roll over, you're going to the floor. <laughs> and I woke up that far from the floor because in my little dream, I had the sensation, you're falling. <laughs> then that sensation became really real when that floor smacked me right in the face. I'm and, not laughing at you. I'm laughing at you. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. She was laughing at me that morning. Um, but, yeah, the nurses probably, they still probably talk about that one. So, well, let, let's, we kind of got sidetracked on that. But um, let's tell them about Takayatsu arteritis. Okay. One in seven million women get it. I hit the lottery. Yeah, so they always say, you know, your wife, me and more, my love, is, you know, your wife's one in a million. No, <laughs> mine's one in seven million. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, interesting facts about my disease. It, most people do not survive the first attack. Because they don't know what it is. They, they, go, they go into the ER just like we did but they don't have the capability to realize they need to maybe go to a bigger hospital that can handle right, or that. misdiagnose, they misdiagnose it, whatever, you know, and, and they, they do not. Um, it's actually a high, it's actually 70%. 70% of the patients that have it don't make it through the first attack. Now, and the interesting fact about Takayatsu arteritis is it actually goes dormant once you get it under control it's still in with you. It's never cured, but it's dormant. Yeah. But you can't. Off. But you can't. Yeah. They call it. It's turned off. But you can relapse, and people that generally relapse and have a second attack, it's even a higher percentage of not making it through the second attack because generally the second attack is even worse than the first attack. Yeah. Ninety percent of the people that made it of that thirty percent that made it through the first attack, 90% of those people don't make it right. through the second one. So Angie's really I'm in there. I'm very lucky. She's and getting I real. know how lucky I am, believe me. But um, I finally got to leave the hospital in late January of that next year. And our parking bill, because the Cadillac, remember the Cadillac <laughs> we mentioned earlier? This is no joke. <laughs> Now, because she was a patient <laughs> that they told me that, you know, we, we didn't have to pay the parking bill. But when I gave him the little parking slip. That he had kept for all those days. I, I kept it in the car. You know, when we pulled in, we put it on the dash. The Cadillac had, had never left. The other family vehicles had went and come and gone and left. <laughs> but I'd never left the hospital. I'd never gone anywhere for her, you 19, 19 days. I'd never left. Right. You and my mom had left. Yeah. So. Because my, well, my mom never left either, right? No, she didn't leave either. Yeah, I didn't think so. Okay, go ahead. We, we went to leave the parking garage. And the parking bill <laughs> was almost $700. <laughs> and, the, and the little guy was like, he's like, boy. I'm glad you got that patient slip because they gave you a little, they gave you a little slip, that a said little you coupon. Were... Basically, said you were a patient, not just a visitor. And he's like, "Boy, he's like, I'm glad you got that little patient slip." He said, "You wouldn't want to pay this." And I remember seeing those little LED numbers. I think it was like seven hundred and forty-four dollars <laughs> and one cent or something. I was like, "Ooh." Yeah, that that would have been rough. Yeah. <laughs> so I left. I finally got to. They let me go from the hospital. I was under the care of eight doctors at that point in time. And when I left, I was on 19 pills a day. Yeah. And I stayed on 19 pills a day for a number of years. Quite a long time. Because the main medication that takes care and keeps me in remission is steroid treatment. And any of you know, if you're on a steroid, you can't just stop that. So I was I actually in the past Three years? Oh, well, five years. Five years? Okay. In the yeah. past five years, I finally came off of that. But T Time flies when you have not I know, it does. But, um, but yes, we came home. I was a whole whopping 96 pounds when we got out of there. And um, 
So I, was, I had to, we lived on. I remember our apartment that was you know rent was paid for that month. So we went back there. Yeah, and I had to carry her up the flight of steps. It was like now, 15. luckily she was only ninety six pounds because she almost wasted away to nothing. Yeah, but she couldn't climb a flight of stairs. Flight she stairs. couldn't do it. Which brings us to what this actually disease did was with the narrowing of my aorta, they did eventually, you know, get my everything aorta. everything from here down. Yeah, waist down. Didn't get any blood flow didn't on any. So, so walking Yeah. Was a chore. Was would ex, you know it was exhausting. Yeah. And at twenty one years old and can't do a flight of fifteen steps, we knew we had to do something about that. Yeah. I, I didn't want I didn't want to keep going and live like that. So well, you got to tell them the, my moment of being the worst husband ever. You were not the worst husband. Okay. Remember how she said I was good before? Here, the best. Here, 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 here's my moment. I was the worst husband in history. All right. Now, mind you, we've been, you know, 19 days in a hospital. hospital. You know, the we're first tired. Yeah, the first few days we're at home. You know, I don't go back to work. Luckily, my work was very understanding. And they were very supportive. Yeah, very right. supportive. But I don't go back to work. I am taking care of her around the clock. And they send her home because she only has one functioning kidney at that time. They send her home on a diuretic. Now, for those of you that don't know what a diuretic is, it makes you pee. A lot. Yeah, it makes you. And <laughs> you know, she was on a very high dose. A lot. Because they wanted her to pee a lot. To keep the kidney open, to keep it flowing, you know, everything, keep it going. That was the kidney, keeping the kidney alive was their number one concern. Mm -hmm. So she is on a serious diuretic, like, <laughs> drink a bottle of water, okay, I've got to pee a gallon, you know. It's, <laughs> uh, so uh, this was, nighttime so, was... So at literally every 30 minutes, I have to carry her to the bathroom <laughs> so she can go pee. Which I mean, I'm I'm gladly doing. I'm glad she's alive. I'm like, okay. So every thirty minutes during the night, we get up. I carry her to the bathroom. She goes pee. We go back to bed. We sleep for another twenty five minutes, <laughs> and then and this goes on for two or three days. And on day three, I mean, we are both exhausted. Not just me, yes. but we're we're, we're, we're both tired. exhausted. Yes. And <laughs> as you know, like she said, she was on nineteen pills. Mm -hmm. As a lot of you know, that when you're on a lot of medicines, you can't go 10 200. <laughs> She's going 10 100 a lot. <laughs> but 10 200, the medicine's got a little roadblock going on there. <laughs> so she, she's like, at about three in the morning, she's like, just leave me for a minute. <laughs> I, I think I'm going to try to go. And I'm like, okay, you know, if you, if you think it's. I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll give you some peace. You know, I'll, I'll let you do your thing. <laughs> well, my dumb self went back and laid down in bed. <laughs> and when I didn't have Angie beside me shaking me to wake me up every 25 minutes, guess what David did? <laughs> it's okay. David slept <laughs> until the sun came up that morning. <laughs> And it's 7 a.m., I jump up in a panic like, shit, where's Angie? And I run in the bathroom. Now, mind you, she's been on a ventilator for 19 days. She doesn't have a voice. I couldn't holler. She can barely, you get up, Bob. You know, she can barely And talk. the bathroom was on the opposite side. Yeah, the bathroom end. was on the opposite side of our apartment. So she couldn't even knock on a wall and get me. So I run in there, and basically, she has fell asleep, <laughs> sitting on the toilet, and she looks at me, and she goes, I can't feel my legs. <laughs> so, yeah, I went from instantly great husband up here to no. <laughs> crashed and burned, the worst husband ever, because I left my wife asleep <laughs> on the toilet because I went to sleep. But no, we had been through so much and during that time. We were both exhausted. Oh, it was both just so, terribly exhausted. So my legs did, did come back around after all that. But we um, ended up about 10 months later. Because because the walking didn't get any better. The, we, they originally gave me a few months to see if maybe my legs would recover. After about six months, 
we all realized I couldn't, I probably, yeah, I couldn't even walk through a store hardly without being, my legs being on fire. Like, that's really how it felt. I don't know how to explain it. Like walking on pin cushions. Yeah. And so we went back <clears throat> 10 months later. And, and you got to say it. How, how do you say what you had? I had double bypass done, femoral to aorta, which means that they actually put a graft in my aorta to make the to make capillaries to go down to my legs to increase the blood flow. Yes. Is that the correct? I got a picture of that too. I know you do, but I don't know where it's at. But maybe he'll find it. Yeah, I got a um, I got a picture. It's it's an X ray, and it shows the it shows the little staples inside on her aorta. The sta the graft doesn't show up, but because it's an x-ray, the staples show up and they look like they're hanging out in midair. Yeah, I remember. <clears throat> so I came home from that and before I even went to have that done, we made the decision because they told us I wouldn't be able to do steps for a while while I was recovering. So Yeah, you wouldn't be able to do anything while no, you was recovering. I came home with about 47 staples. Oh, yeah, she was cut from here all the way down and both legs so so they could get to the a, aorta. It was a huge recovery time for me, <sighs> but we decided my mom was gracious enough to let us move in with her. And so we left our apartment, which not so fun fact about that. One month later. Yeah, one month later after we moved out. And remember, I had to carry up the flight of stairs. Yes. We were on the second floor. Our apartment, apartment burned, burned to down. the ground. So the good Lord is definitely washed over us because there was no way to say the least that angie could have gotten out of a burning apartment but yeah gotten down the flight of stairs and gotten out of the house on mm -hmm. her own if i had been at, at at that time i had gone back to work you know you know from eight to five and oh, she she couldn't have gotten out yeah. before it burned so so the surgery was a success though um i had to do a lot of rehab and things but I, I did get blood flow to my legs. I still, to this day, I am actually one of the youngest patients that they've ever done that surgery to. So, <laughs> we asked them, we, we did wait way long ago, we asked them how long that surgery was supposed to last. Because it was a horrible surgery. Yeah, yeah, because, well, it was a horrible surgery, and Angie didn't really want to go through it again, but Not we really. were kind of like, how long does hey, this how last? long does this last? You know, how long is this good for? <laughs> and he goes... Well, we're not really we're not sure. Really sure so. He said, you're one of the youngest people we've ever put it in. <laughs> he said, usually everybody we put this in dies of old age. Right. And we so, were like, oh. oh. Interesting. Yeah. So, fun fact. Yeah, fun fact. But um, anyway, after that, we really tried our best to get back to what we call normal life. Yeah, normal for us. Normal for us, right. So um, we started building our home, which is... What we're in now. What we're in now. Um, I went back to work after a few years. It, it was probably a year after my surgery wow. or a couple. Yeah, probably um, a couple I years. went back to work and for the next nine, eight, nine years, we lived pretty normal lives. You know, we, um, we both worked. We built our home, which that took a lot of our time. And we worked they on always say, if a marriage can survive building a home. <laughs> but we was, hey, we were, we, we'd already survived we this. Already, the home was cakewalk. Yeah, yeah. yeah for sure. So, um, and we worked on cars during that time, but they were our cars. But yes. we, we actually gave up racing because I really couldn't handle the, uh, we raced dirt tracks. So it was a very much. Due to her lung. My lung issues. We couldn't really she go couldn't, back. She couldn't go to the dust. So, and everything it wasn't. So we kind of switched gears and went more with the classic cars. And really, in the grand scheme of things, we can go to a car show and bring our stuff home. And generally, it's in one piece. Okay, don't bring up about <laughs> skid at this moment. But generally, we can. You go to the dirt track, and that doesn't always happen. But anyway. Too soon. Was, too, soon. Was too, too soon. soon. Too soon. Wound's yeah. still fresh. Yeah, yeah. As it's on jack stands. But anyway, if you haven't watched that video, you have to watch it. It's hilarious. But um, then, I guess, what would you say? My job was... Your job was a little stressful. Yeah. And it, tur it turned her disease back on. And I was in Georgia for work. 
and my sister called me, the, remember the nurse practitioner, she called me and said that she was rushing Angie to the hospital and I needed to get there. And needless to say, it was an eight hour drive from where I was. I was almost in Atlanta, Georgia, back to here. And I think I made it in five hours and oh, something. I don't know. I broke every speed limit. I mean. But lucky for us though, we already had our team of doctors in place and they knew how to handle it. Right, they this. knew they didn't have so that learning curve. It wasn't period. that learning curve that we had before. Yes. So um, they just upped my medicine back up, got me back on track. And so after the relapse, we kind of made a decision that. She decided she'd have a new job. Yeah, you, my new job would be the best <laughs> job ever. <laughs> To she, be, <laughs> she, her job was just to be my number one best friend. That That's was right. her. That was her That's job. Right. My job was to take care of the house stuff and us to have fun. Yes. So, because um, we figured we made it through the first one and we made it through the second one, and all odds were against us on both events. Yes. So, and we didn't want to know what the numbers were for a third event. No, so we, we didn't. did not. We did not. So, um, I took a, a slower paced life. Yes. And um, actually, I've been doing really well. And in 2017? Yes. In 2017, they approached me with the magazine for that is the University of Virginia magazine called Bim and Bigger. I'll put in, I'll insert the pictures. And they approached us to do an article for the winter issue of 2017. And they asked us if they could just do a story on us. Um because most of my doctors had apparently reached out and said that we were very compliant. I take my medicines, I do what they asked me to do, and that I'm doing really well. Now, before this, Angie has an article in the American Medical Journal written about her. But if, since it's the American Medical Journal, they don't insert patients' names, no. do they? But no. They just state all the facts of the right. case. This one... We got to be really be us. Yes, yeah, since it was an so, article for Vim and Bigger the magazine. So we, I told them that we would be honored to do that. And if that article, you know, it goes all over the U.S. So if a doctor reads that and then becomes familiar with Takiyatsu arteritis, then maybe this whole big percentage of people passing away or not making it through the first onset will be a lot lower if they know what they're looking for. So we did the article. Let me say, it was a blast for me. David, not now see, so right, it's much. The winner, the winner issue of magazine. So think about it. They're doing the magazine. They're working on it beforehand, ahead and, of time. And I mean, this was a full-on magazine thing. Like, they provided our outfits. Yes, they, they dressed us. I got hair and makeup. Yeah, I Angie got hair and makeup. I, yeah, I got hair and makeup, too. <laughs> um... And it was actually taken, the pictures were taken in at UVA August. in August. Now, they had us in winter attire. <laughs> okay, you'll see the picture of what I'm wearing, and you're going to know, no, David doesn't wear that on a normal basis. <laughs> and it's August and it in is, Virginia. And it is 90 degrees. It was more than 90. <laughs> and they've got me dressed more than this. So, needless to say, while I'm standing in the sun waiting on hair and makeup over here <laughs> to, to have her moment, I'm standing there sweating. They get ready for the photo shoot, and this little production assistant runs up to me. And goes, oh, you're sweating. And go, oh, you're sweating. <laughs> and she takes, now granted, I don't have my hat on, and I'm standing just like this. And she, she takes, goes, oh, you're sweating. And all of a sudden, takes, I take, hear. Takes roll-on deodorant <laughs> and runs that stuff across my forehead, right here, back and forth, and goes, that'll stop you from sweating. And I just <laughs> looked at her. And I was like, no, you didn't. You just put roll-on deodorant on my forehead. And she just... Run, you know, uh, runs off and goes, and they're like, Re ready, take the pictures. And I'm like, I got deodorant on my forehead. <laughs> hey, I was having a blast. Every time I got a little bit of sweat, they came in and put a little powder. I didn't get it. Yeah, yeah, I got the, <laughs> I got the right guard across my forehead. But we, uh, 
it was really fun, and it's a really great article. It's really yeah, it, it it's written well. It kind of tells a, our story, and they can't due to HIPAA, you know, and everything. They can't tell us about the other patients that no. they've had at UVA that have Angie's disease. I mean, disease. They, they told us that there are a couple, but they won't, you know, obviously with HIPAA, you can't. But they said out of the ones that they have, Angie's doing the best. Yeah. They did tell us that. And they said mainly because Angie's compliant and taking the meds and doing the stuff that they ask is probably why she's done the best she has. And I mean, it's not easy, guys. I'm not going to tell you it's easy. We go to UVA every, now it's about every six months. But before, during, it was every, it three, was every months. three months. COVID kind of yeah, COVID, backed them off on that. Right, it did. It did. And um, so that kind of brings us full circle to when COVID hit. Now, mind you, during all this time when I was being when I was home and I wasn't working anymore, you know, obviously we were a one income family and David had to travel a lot. So if y'all all know us, y'all all know his stories of when he was on the road and David had to be on the road a lot because we had to make ends meet yeah. some way. So COVID hits and David gets to stay home because the world shut down. So we enjoyed that so very much we enjoy we getting to be together it's not every, we, every single day yeah it, it wasn't that we weren't together when he was traveling but there would be weeks at a time where he would be on the road and you know i i would be here and he's wherever all over the world so it was nice that he was home and we got to spend every day together and so i guess we have to tell y'all that one morning at our breakfast table I was looking out. I was looking out the window, <laughs> looking down, and I, I was I was looking out, and I was thinking about the things. You know, when I clocked out that evening, I was going to come down here and work in the garage. What was I going to work on? And the thought occurred to me that I was like, "We need to make this a reality." Yep, we both. I need to do this for a living. That I need to be here every day because they were, they came back. And they were starting to send me out on the road again. Yeah, he knew that we knew our time was shortening as, and that he was going to have to go back on the road. And both of us were dreading it. Yeah. I did that last trip to Korea, and that was like a, I was putting that, na that last nail in the coffin. Yeah. I, I came home to her, and I said, we're going to figure out how so, to make this work. So at our breakfast nook that morning was actually how when A&D Hot Rod Shop was born. Yeah, that was... We both... We both sat there and we looked at each other and we both said, we love being together every day. We're going to do this together and let's make it a reality. And yes. that's exactly what we've done. So, and you know, when we, when we end our videos and we say, thank, thank you, Lord, Lord thank, thank you for today, today. There, there's a reason yeah. that we're grateful yeah. for every day because it could have been very easily... You know, any one of the things could have happened. Oh. You know, any happen. any misstep. Yes. You know, and we wouldn't have had all these days together. Right. So right. we're grateful for every one of the days we have. It's why we go on power tour, why we take the crazy road trips and, and that make no sense and just drive everywhere. You know, literally we drive the wheels off the car. <laughs> <But> <laughs> too soon. Too, too soon. soon. Yeah. yeah, too soon. <laughs> Uh, but we, you know, all of this happening made David and Angie who we are today. But all of this also made Andy Hot Rod Shop. Yes. And I told her when she woke up. Now, when, when she woke up, I told her. Oh, he did do this. this is that, that, you know, I, well, I made sure she was good and conscious <laughs> first. But I told her that she could have believed me. Because just three months before... We had done our wedding vows in sickness and in health for richer, for poor, for better, for worse. And I told her, I said, she could have just believed me. <laughs> she didn't have to try all those out all in one period. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but guys, really uh, cherish the time you have with everyone. 
Yes. Because in the blink of an eye, everything can change. Believe yes. me, we know it. We know it well. Um, so we hope we haven't. We hope we haven't bored you, bored to, you death. to death on this. But this story is so important to us during the holidays. We cherish Christmas. Yeah, Christmas is special anyway, but it's, but it's really, really special, special to us. Yes, very much so. Um, but guys, just enjoy every day. Have fun. Laugh. Yes. You know, don't worry. I, I, I say this a lot. You know, during the holidays, it's easy to do. Like, it seems like something happens. You burn the turkey. You burn the ham. The cat knocks the tree over. The kids are running around <laughs> crazy. Enjoy the craziness. Yes. Because it could be a, on a whole other level of crazy. On a whole other level of crazy. So, but we hope you enjoyed this. And we hope for the ones that tuned in thinking it was a power tour video. Don't worry, uh, we got you. Don't don't worry. <laughs> we're coming with them in January. Yeah, don't yeah. worry. January's not that far away. Yes. We're we're coming with more power tour videos. Yes. And hopefully we're gonna see you June. We're gonna see you out on yes. Power Tour. We can't wait to see all of yeah. you. Yeah. Lord willing and the creeks don't um, rise, we're gonna be there. I'm telling you, we had a blast on Power Tour last year. It was oh, so right. fun. It was so fun to meet all of you guys. So yes. if you're watching and you're going on Power Tour, make sure you stop and say hey. Yes. Because we, we thoroughly enjoyed everybody yes, we talking did. to them, seeing yeah. them. Yeah. Yes. Don't hold us to names, though. We're awful I with am, names. But. I am terrible with names. So if you tell me like 17 times, <laughs> I'm going to get it. Yeah. But if you say it once we and then we start talking about your car, I'm going to remember the car and I'm not going to have a clue of what your name was. So don't hold that to me, but I'm going to remember what you tell me about the car. That's right. So. Let's tell them Merry Christmas, guys. Merry Christmas, everybody. Uh, 2024 is shaping up to be really big and exciting at A&D, so stay tuned. Yes. For lots more videos and fun builds and, of course, Power Tour. Power Tour. Power Tour is coming at you. It's coming we're going. Quick. We're doing a twofer. Yes. Power Tour twofer next year. Yeah, East and, and West. And it's the 30th. Uh, it is. It is. So that's going to be super exciting. So, we'll, go, we'll do long hauler on both and be the ultimate long hauler. Yes. You heard it from him. So. <laughs> and how we end all, all of our videos. videos. Thank, thank you, Lord. Lord. Thank, thank you for, for today. today.